physical universe does not have to be the way it is. It could have been otherwise. And thus the first alternative, natural law, is not very plausible. Well, what about the second alternative, that the fine-tuning is due to chance? The problem with this alternative is that the odds against the fine-tunings occurring by accident are so incomprehensibly great that they cannot be reasonably faced. When you compare the range of possible values which the fundamental quantities uh, permitted by the laws of nature could have taken with the range of life-permitting values, you find that the range of life-permitting values is incomprehensibly small in comparison with the wider range of assumable values. The probability that all the quantities would fall by chance alone into the life-permitting range is vanishingly small. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life-permitting universe like ours. But that brings us to the third alternative, intelligent design. A one-time agnostic, Davies now says, through my scientific work, I have come to believe more and more strongly that the physical universe is put together with an ingenuity so astonishing that I cannot accept it as a brute fact. Similarly, Fred Hoyle remarks, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. And Robert Jastrow, the head of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, calls this the most powerful evidence for the existence of God ever to come out of science. We can summarize our reasoning as follows. Premise one, the fine tuning of the initial conditions of the universe is due to either law, chance, or design. Two, it is not due to either law or chance. Three, therefore, it is due to design. Number three, objective moral values in the world. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. By objective moral values, I mean moral values which are valid and binding whether anybody believes in them or not. For example, to say that the Holocaust was objectively evil is to say that the Holocaust was wrong even though the Nazis who carried it out believed that it was right. And it would still have been wrong even if the Nazis had won World War II and succeeded in exterminating or brainwashing anybody who disagreed with them. And my argument is that if God does not exist, then moral values are not objective in that sense. Now, many theists and atheists alike concur on this point. For example, Michael Roos, a noted agnostic philosopher of science, explains, the position of the modern evolutionist is that morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory." End quote. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the destruction of all meaning and value in life. I think that Friedrich Nietzsche was right. But we've got to be very careful here. The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I certainly think that we can. Rather, the question is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values exist? Like Professor Roos, I honestly don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, 
the morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objective. In the absence of God, we are just accidental byproducts of nature which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe and which are doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. On the atheistic view, some action, say rape, may not be socially advantageous and so in the course of human development has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the atheistic view, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. Thus, without God, there is no absolute right and wrong which imposes itself on our conscience. But the problem is that objective values do exist, and deep down, I think we all know it. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just uh, socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. As Michael Roos himself admits, the man who says raping little children is morally acceptable is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, and generosity, and self-sacrifice are really good. Thus, we can summarize this third consideration as follows. Premise one, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, objective values do exist, from which it follows logically and inescapably, three, Therefore, God exists. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was a remarkable individual. New Testament critics have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come. And as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just accept on faith or not. But in fact, there are actually three established facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian scholar who has specialized in the study of the resurrection, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. According to D.H. Van Dalen, it is extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. Those who deny it, he says, do so on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent German New Testament critic, Gaut Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a dying, much less rising, Messiah. And Jewish beliefs about the afterlife 